hello everybody. Do you want to flick back to Exodus chapter 15 and I'll lead us as we pray. Let's pray. Our Father God, we're so thankful that we've just heard you speak to us in your word and we pray now that you'd please um, teach us who you are, that deepen us in our knowledge of you, your grace towards us and so increase our adoration, our praise and our joy and our salvation. Amen. Well, tonight we're thinking into something incredibly serious, something incredibly dangerous, and something that has sent many people to hell. Grumbling. Grumbling, complaining about things. Oh, if only my, this, my, um, if this thing in my life wasn't there, then my life would be okay and I'd be alright. If only this person wasn't so difficult every week, making life tricky. If only I had this, then I could really be happy. Grumbling. And I I reckon for most of us, grumbling doesn't seem like such a big deal. It certainly doesn't seem like something deserving of condemnation, of judgment, of hell. And I think we think that because grumbling is such a normal part of of what we do, of Aussie culture. Um, You know, it it doesn't seem like some crazy sin, like murdering someone, it's just complaining, it doesn't seem that bad. You know, you catch up with a friend and they ask you how you're going and you go, ugh, my boss is driving me nuts and you vent and that's just how we talk, it's just so normal to us and because it's so normalised, it's just what all of us do, some of us some of the time, some of us most of the time and you don't want to be that person, do you? We grumble about people, about work, about our boss, about our family members, about church. When we're with this friend, we grumble about that friend. When we're with that friend, we grumble about this friend. And I reckon there's even a a kind of delight and a, a pleasure that we have in grumbling. And if you don't believe me, just look at any, the comment section of any YouTube video ever posted on YouTube. And yet, what is absolutely clear from the Bible is that grumbling is a serious sin, one worthy of judgment. James chapter 5 verse 9 says, don't grumble against one another, brothers and sisters, or you will be judged. The judge is standing at the door. And 1 Corinthians 10, which actually reflects back on our um, bunch of chapters we're looking at in Exodus tonight, 1 Corinthians looks back here and sees the Israelites grumbling and it says this, do not grumble as some of them did, the Israelites, and were killed by the destroying angel. People were killed for this. Now, if grumbling grumbling really is such a serious sin and my assessment of us is true or or just generally as a culture is true, that we all grumble on a fairly um, regular basis and it's just a normal part of our life, if that's true, then it's imperative that we learn how to stop grumbling. It's imperative that we learn um, to understand it for what it truly is and that we get the cure for it. We learn how to put it to death, how to put this sin to death. And so that's where we're going tonight. Tonight we're going to um, track through five or six chapters of, of Exodus, something like that, Exodus 13 to 18, and we're going to recount, we're going to see the recount of Israel's rescue from slavery. We're kind of finally up to that moment where we've been tracking through Exodus, God's been preparing, He's been pouring out the plagues on the Egyptians and we're finally at the moment where He's going to rescue them. And what we're going to see straight after is a mixed response from Israel. Initially, they're going to respond well and rightly and they're going to praise God and we're going to learn how to respond rightly by their example and then very quickly we're going to see them grumbling. And yet in all of that, we see the grace of God, His incredible kindness to sinners which will be part of the cure for grumbling. And so the plan for us tonight is two steps. We're going to track through a million chapters of Exodus really quickly. And then secondly, we're going to look at what are the lessons we need to learn so that we wouldn't be like the Israelites. So that's what we're going to do. And my hope for us in all of this is that God might heal our hearts of grumbling. That He might actually teach us to think rightly about Him and ourselves in the world and actually might do a, um, an emotional work for us, that He might train our, our minds and our, our hearts, our affections, our emotions, so that when we are faced with situations where our natural instinct is to grumble, God may, have, may transform us and we might 
learn to, to think and even feel rightly toward him in those moments. So that's what we're doing. Have a look, um, ch- flick back with me to chapter 13 of Exodus. Now, the context is chapter 12, of course, the Passover. And finally, what's happened is that Pharaoh, because of the death of the firstborn sons, the Passover, Pharaoh has said, leave, go, get out of Egypt. And so, chapter 13, verse 17, the Lord is now leading Israel out of Egypt towards the Red Sea. But because God knows the people's weakness, He takes them the long way around, because He knows that if they go this way, they'll be faced um, with war with the Philistines, and so He goes, all right, I know you're weak, I'll take you this way instead. And He promises, uh, sorry, he, He takes them the long way away from the land that He'd promised them. It looks like they're going in the wrong direction, but really it's the grace of God. And verse 17 says, if they face war, they might change their minds and so and return to Egypt. <clears throat> and verse 21, God is guiding Israel every step of the way. Verse 21, by day the Lord went ahead of them in a pillar of cloud to guide them on their way, and by night a pillar of fire to give them light, so that they could travel by day or by night. Still, God is doing this incredible, uh, miraculous sort of thing, this, um, this strange phenomena uh, in His great mercy to Israel, to lead them away from the land of slavery. And yet, here's the complication, that is the, the Egyptians, sorry, the Egyptians are back. So, because God had led them down this way, and He sort of leads them on this funny journey, and the Egyptians look ahead and they see that they're now stuck between a sea and this place where they can't get out of, and because God has hardened Pharaoh's heart once again, and so the Egyptians go, I've changed my mind, I've let them go, but now I want them back. And just like that, the Israelites lose their faith in God again. Despite the Lord's power being clearly manifested before them for all those plagues, He finally rescued them out. Now the pillar of cloud and the pillar of fire, even that's not enough for them, They turn back, they see the Egyptians hot on their tail and they lose their faith. So, chapter 14, verse 10, as Pharaoh approached, the Israelites looked up and there were the Egyptians marching after them and they were terrified and cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you brought us to the desert to die? But what have you done to us by bringing us out of Egypt? Didn't we say to you in Egypt, leave us alone, let us serve the Egyptians? And I'm pretty sure that word serve there is the same as the worship word. God's rescuing them from Egypt, taking them out to serve Him in the wilderness, to worship Him in the wilderness. And they say, leave us in Egypt so that we could have died there or served the Egyptians. It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the desert. Straight away, the law, uh, Israel lose their faith. And yet, even in that context, God rescues them by a mighty miracle, the parting of the Red Sea. Verse 21, then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea and all that night, the Lord drove the sea back with a strong east wind and turned it into dry land. The waters were divided and the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground with a wall of water on their right and on their left. And what's absolutely clear from all of this is that God is the one who has worked their salvation. Again and again through that chapter, I don't have time but I think we've got a slide for it, it's clear God is the one who's done this. God has saved them. He's the one behind it. Israel didn't have to do anything, they need only be still and they'd be saved. And so that brings us up to chapter 15 and Israel at this moment respond beautifully in a way that we should learn from them. They respond with gratitude, praising God, glorifying God in song. Chapter 15, the whole community raise their voices together, praising God for the mighty salvation He's worked for them. Have a look at chapter 15, verse 1. I will sing to the Lord, for He is highly exalted. Both horse and driver He's hurled into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my defence. He has become my salvation. He is my God. I will praise Him, my Father's God, and I will exalt Him. The Lord is a warrior. The Lord is His name. Now, the context, the, the content of the song, sorry, is they recount and rehearse what God has done 
and they say, God has saved us. He's hurled the horse and chariot into the sea. He's drowned them. He's rescued them. So they recount what he's done, his acts. But what they, they do next is they learn from his acts what he's like. And then they praise him for what he's like. So verse 11, they say, Who among the gods is like you, Lord? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glory, working wonders? Seeing God at work, they learn who He is, the one who's absolutely unique, unqualified in glory, unmatched in power, there is no one else like Him, and at that point, they just can't help but bust out in praise. Now, I don't know how much it's actually busting out in praise, they're all singing this together, and so it does seem like somebody has taken the time to write this song and distribute it to everybody somehow, and they've learnt this song and they've sung it together, and so just for us, It is really important that we have good songs that appropriately recount what the Lord has done for us in the Lord Jesus and then and learning who God is and that we sing those and we sing those well and we need people to write good songs like that. It's fitting for us to rehearse the great acts of God that He's done for us and to praise Him together as a congregation. Now, just another thing about the song, I know some of you may have been um, considering this during the week, some have wondered at the appropriateness of the Israelites celebrating the drowning of the Egyptians. But I think a couple of things to keep in mind, Um, first of all, uh, it is the Lord who did this, so they are celebrating the acts of the Lord in rescuing them, and it's always right for God to judge evil. Now, God is incredibly gracious, and so for all those who trust in Jesus, He passes over our sins, and He punishes our evil on Jesus, but the point there is, He still punishes evil. If God so chooses to not, to punish us for our sins, especially all those who don't, well, all of those, not especially, but those who don't trust in Christ, that will be a right thing for him to do. It's, it's right when he punishes evil, is the first thing. But second thing, this specific context is this is wartime. This is one nation warring against another nation. So it is a specific context. And here's the other thing. I take it we'd feel differently had we been the Israelites enslaved under the Egyptians for 400 years. And especially because of uh, Exodus chapter 1. Do you remember how this whole story began? What were the Egyptians doing to the Hebrews? Drowning their children in the Nile. Well, here is retribution. The Lord drowns their army in the the Red Sea. I think it's right for them to celebrate. And if it is right for them to celebrate and rejoice, rightly praising God like this for um, rescuing them from hard-hearted Pharaoh, it all goes very south very quickly. Because three days after this, it's now the Israelites who are the ones with the hard hearts. Now, I'm going to speed through the next couple of chapters, but what we come to next are three accounts of the Israelites quickly forgetting the Lord's great works to them, in saving them, and grumbling at Him, despite all He's done. And yet, in every instance, God is gracious. So, the end of chapter 15, have a look there with me, from verse 22, the story of Mara. Verse 22, when Moses led Israel from the Red Sea and they went into the desert of Shur, for three days they travelled in the desert without finding water, and when they came to Marah, they could not drink its water because it was bitter. And that's why it's called Marah, because Marah means bitter. So the people grumbled against Moses, saying, What are we to drink? And like the bitter waters of Marah, the Israelites are now bitter at God because they've got nothing to drink. Now, you might be tempted to think, Yeah, but people need to drink water. So what's, what, what's wrong with them complaining and grumbling about not having water to drink? But what this is, is not them just saying, I'm thirsty, which is fine for humans to say, because we need water to to survive. It's not just them saying, I'm thirsty. They are grumbling. This is them saying, I don't trust you, God. 
Yeah, um, sure, they don't have water to drink. But it's not like the Lord doesn't know what to do with water. In fact, the Lord has just demonstrated that He, he kind of rules over water. He, earlier, He turned the Nile into blood. Just three days earlier, He parted an entire sea and put a wall of water on their left and their right. Now, if they had remembered that, maybe the better response would have been to cry out to God and say, um, Lord, gracious God who saves us, please provide. <clears throat> Three days earlier, um, chapter 15, verse 13, they'd been singing this, verse 13, Lord, in Your unfailing love, You will lead the people You have redeemed. In Your strength, You will guide them. Well, they don't seem to believe that anymore. They don't seem to believe that in the Lord's unfailing love, He'll lead them where they need to go. Now they're thirsty, they've forgotten all that. And so, forgetting Yahweh, their Saviour, they grumble. And yet, even in their grumbling and their forgetfulness, God is still faithful, still full of grace. Have a look at verse 25. Then Moses cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a piece of wood. He threw it into the water, and the water became fit to drink. And so, despite their grumbling, God is gracious. There's the first incident, the story of Mara. Come to chapter 16 now, the story of the manna, where this whole pattern repeats itself again, but this time it kind of intensifies. Have a look at chapter 16, verse 2 with me. In the desert, the whole community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The Israelites said to them, if only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt. There we sat around pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted, but you have brought us out into this desert to starve this entire assembly to death. This time they're hungry. Now, fair enough, people need to eat food, but their hearts are not right in this situation. Their whole, and their whole view of things just so quickly just gets turned on its head and messed up. They forget what Egypt was really like. Um, they say, we had all the meat that we wanted, we were sitting around just eating meat. Now, um, the last meat they ate in Egypt was actually the Passover. And who gave them the Passover meal? That was the Lord, not the Egyptians. They're not really remembering things very well. They've forgotten what God's truly like. They're, they See there, they accuse Him of bringing them out to starve them to death. Is that really what, how God has been treating them? That's not the Lord, that's not Yahweh who said, I'll win this battle for you, you need only be still, who provided, provided for them again and again. They've completely, everything's messed up and turned around. And note that it's actually the Lord that they've grumbled at here. It says that they grumbled to Moses and Aaron, verse 2, but at, by the end of verse 8, Moses says, uh, verse 8, who are we you are not grumbling against us, but against the Lord. And this is why grumbling is a sin. It's not that their circumstances weren't genuinely hard. It's like, we need food to eat. But complaining the way they were, and doubting God's goodness as they were, was wrong. This is the God who cared for them. This is the God who who rescued them from slavery, who said, you need only be still and I'll do it all for you. What they, should, they shouldn't have been complaining, they should have been praying. They should have been praying to their great, gracious God who provided for them at every step. Well, how's, gonna, how's God going to respond to this stubborn, hard-hearted people? Full of grace and compassion. In His grace, He provides for them again, this time the bread that they need, they're, they're hungry and so He provides for them bread and meat because they, they remember the, the meat they had back in Egypt. And so, verse 11, chapter 16, verse 11, the Lord said to Moses, I have heard the grumbling of the Israelites, tell them at twilight you will eat meat and in the morning you will be filled with bread, then you will know that I am the Lord, Yahweh, your God, then you will know that I'm Yahweh and then you'll be able to trust me. <laughs> I'll do something again for you, so that you can see who I am toward you, the gracious God. I've not brought you out here to kill you, 
I rescued you so that you could worship and serve me in the wilderness. Now, God by now um, knows their forgetfulness and He wants them to remember Him and so He gives them this manna and there's this whole kind of recounting of um, what they're to do with the manna because this is going to go on for some time. And um, verse 32, God wanting them to remember, He commands them, take some of the manna I give you, this miraculous bread from heaven, stick it in a jar and keep it for the generations to come. So that into into the generations you can point to the bread and remember me correctly, that I'm not the God who's brought you out here to kill you, I'm the God who has graciously saved you and even now am providing for you. And so He gets them to do this thing. There's the, the second event... The third one, the story of Massa and Meribah. Now, I know there's way too much alliteration for one sermon. Um, Once again, there's no water to drink, and so how are they going to respond? Well, how are their memories so far? Verse 2, have a look at verse 2, chapter 17. So they quarrelled with Moses and said, give us water to drink. And once again, you might be tempted to think, come on, Dan, give these guys a break. Yes, they're grumbling, but they're thirsty. They're in, they are in a desert. We need to drink. But again, they're complaining rather than praying. They've, they haven't learnt who the Lord actually is. They're still not thinking of Yahweh rightly. They still think of Him as this God who... Um, He's there one moment and then something doesn't go well for me and so He must have abandoned me. And I've forgotten everything He's done for me so far because my circumstance now is difficult. And if my circumstance now is difficult, He's not God anymore or He doesn't care about me anymore. They have very poor memories and they've got their whole thinking about Yahweh messed up. Now, just quickly, is that, is that you? Is that the pattern of your, um, your life? Is that the pattern of your thinking about God? When things are going well, are you pleased with God? Do you delight in God? You're happy with God? And then things get hard and you think, God's abandoned me. He's not, in, he's not with me in this. That's not the God who commits to people. God, our God is the one who saves people and, and commits to them, becomes their God and wants us to know who He is, saying, here I am, this is what I'm like, I'm with you, I love you, I am for you. Now, they've forgotten again, they're thirsty and so they've forgotten the Nile being turned into blood, they've forgotten that God is the one who's sovereign over the Red Sea, they've forgotten that they were thirsty a few, a little while ago, a month ago and they, God miraculously provided water, they've forgotten all of this, but Yahweh's the God over the waters, surely He can provide for them here again and once again in His grace He does. Chapter 17 verse 5, the Lord answered Moses, go out in front of the people, take, some, take with you some of the elders of Israel in your, and take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile and go. So, He takes His staff which if you remember from earlier in Exodus is the, it's the staff of judgment, right? He takes this staff and verse 6, I will stand there before you, says God. I, Yahweh, will stand there before you by the rock at Horeb. Strike the rock where I'm standing and water will come out of it for the people to drink. Now, very interestingly, 1 Corinthians 10 reflects back on this and says, Jesus was the rock. We'll come back to that because what does that mean? And in the last bit of chapter 17, Yahweh provides for Israel again. He's provided water for them then. Then the next bit of chapter 17, there's a fight between the Amalekites and the Israelites. Yahweh provides the victory. And then chapter 18, another example of the right way to respond to Yahweh in all of this. Another um, instance of praise. Uh, This time Jethro, who's a Gentile, is the one who's responding rightly Jethro is Moses' father-in-law and he comes to see Moses and Moses recounts, rehearses all the great deeds that Yahweh has done for them, how he saved them and Jethro responds in praise to the Lord and he says, now I know that the Lord is greater than all the gods. The Gentile's the one who gets it in the end. Very interesting. A little foretaste of 
the gospel going out to the Gentiles, us. So there you go, there's a brief overview, and I know it was very quick, I'm sorry for that, and I've missed out important things, um, but there you go, there's a brief overview of chapter 13 to 18 of Exodus. But what we would find, unfortunately, if we kept tracking through and we found our way into the book of Numbers, is that the Israelites' hearts continue to be hardened toward God, and eventually God's patience comes to an end, and all this generation dies in the desert. Not because God brought them out there for that, but because they continued to be hardened towards Him. Their grumbling was a serious sin. And so, what lessons do we need to learn from them that we might not be like them? Because that's what 1 Corinthians 10 urges us to do. It says, Look to the, learn from their example to not grumble the way they did. So, what lessons do we need to learn? I've got three lessons for us. Here we go. First lesson, learn to see grumbling for what it truly is. It's hard-heartedness towards God. See, when we grumble, we're, what we're implicitly saying, even though we're not mouthing those words, is, God, you have wronged me. I deserve more than this. Life should be like this for me, and you've given me this, you've done me wrong. We exist under a sovereign God, we exist under the God who's in control of all things. And so, um, he's, in, he's in control of our health, our work, our relationships, our living stances, circumstances, all of it. And so, when we grumble and complain about all those things, we're implicitly saying to God, I deserve more, you're not dealing with me right, you've got it wrong, and I don't trust you've got my good in mind. Do you treat grumbling and complaining as a small thing? I think we all do. But it's really not, it's a window into our hearts and our trust of God. When we grumble, in those moments, we're viewing God as stingy, as not really out for our good, as untrustworthy. But that's not God, that's not our God, is it? Second lesson, learn to see God as He truly is our gracious and compassionate Heavenly Father, who works in all circumstances for our good, even the ones that suck. See, the same Yahweh who rescued Israel out of slavery is our Father who has rescued us out of slavery to sin, Satan and death. That's our God. That's how God has treated you. The same Yahweh who provided for Israel the manna from heaven, the bread, is the same Lord who has come to us as the bread of life Himself, who says, all who come to me will never go thirsty and anyone who believes in me will never be hungry. The same God, Yahweh, who stood next to the rock and said to Moses, strike the rock and water will pour out for all those who are thirsty to drink. That same God who did that is the one who came to us and who was, who was struck on the cross so that the blessing of salvation might pour out to all those who would believe in Him. That same Yahweh who the Israelites grumbled at became an Israelite Himself, that He might live in our shoes. This is why I had us read Mark chapter 1 before. At the beginning of Jesus' ministry, He goes through the waters of baptism, like the Israelites were drawn through the waters at the Red Sea. And the next thing Mark says is that He goes out into the desert, where for 40 days He goes without food and water, and He's tempted by Satan, and yet He never grumbles against God. And He did that for us. Jesus did that to live the perfect life, to come as the true Son, the true Israelite, so that despite our terrible forgetfulness, because Israel is just a picture of us, 
despite all our terrible forgetfulness, despite our, our lack of gratitude toward God, despite our grumbling, Jesus has been the perfect Israel. And so I can be forgiven freely. And though God is just to punish sin and our evil, and He could do that, He chooses to have punished the perfect Israelite so that we don't have to be. That's our God towards us. He's gracious, He's compassionate. And one of the most glorious parts of the Bible, Romans 8, reflecting on this incredible truth, says, if God has so cared for us in this way, in the death of the Lord Jesus, if He's so cared for us like this, how could He not also now care for us in all circumstances of life? Of course, He cares for us in everything. And so it says, he, in all things, God works for the good of those who love Him. In all things, even when life feels really hard and sucky, even in that, God is working for the good of those who love Him. God's not abandoned us in that moment. He's still someone we can trust and cry out to and say, Lord, help me right now, this is really uncomfortable. He says, if he, he who did not spare His own Son, but graciously gave him, him up for us all, if He did that, how will He not also, along with Jesus, going to the cross, graciously give us all things we need? If God did this, if the Lord Jesus would, would, be, would be the rock that gets struck by the judgment of God for our sin, if He's done that, how will He not also care for us when life feels like it sucks? He still cares for us when it sucks. Now, if that's true, if that's true, we can trust God in every circumstance. We can know that He loves us and cares for us and is for us in every circumstance even when life feels like it sucks. Oh, we might not enjoy what we're going through. We might cry out to God, please take this away from me. When Jesus was the rock being struck by the judgment of God on the cross, the night, he, no, during that, He cried out, um, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because He, he was genuinely experiencing God forsakenness. And so He cries out to God, but in that moment, He's there to please His Father. He's doing it knowing that the God who he's, he's, he's serving on the cross is His Father who's working for, his, for the salvation of His people and who has not abandoned Him even in that moment. Even on the cross, the Father would not abandon the Son. We can trust God in all things. Now, I've got a friend who, um, when I ask him, how are you going? He, he's, within his family scenario, he, uh, he has very difficult things happening. But when I ask him, how are you going? You know what his first words always are? He says, God is good, just like that. God is good. Uh, and then he, he says, you know, we're finding this hard at the moment, but I know the love of God for me, and He's teaching us, and God is good. And that's how He responds every time. And I don't think He's faking it. I think what He knows is that He, if, if the Lord would not spare His own Son, but send Him graciously to die for us, whilst we were still sinners, if that's true, how could He not also, along with Him, graciously care for us in all circumstances? He knows His God, Now, I'm not saying we can't cry out to God when it's hard. No, the opposite. We should cry out to God, not at God. God wants us to do that. Like the Israelites cried out to Him in chapter 2 when they were enslaved and their cry went up to the Lord and He had compassion on them because they were crying out to Him. How do you know if you're... Um, you're grumbling or you're expressing right grief at a hardship? Well, I think you probably know. In the moment, you know, don't you? You might not want to admit it if you are grumbling and not... It's a matter of the heart. In your expressing of grief or frustration, are you still in the same moment grateful to God for all His kindness towards you? Are you still trusting that as much as I really don't like what I'm going through, God is my loving Heavenly Father who's got me. Are you, speak, are you still speaking with that heart? That's the thing. It's, it's a matter of the heart. 
Are you venting um, because you actually want to take revenge on someone who's annoying you? You know, you're venting to this person because you want to get back at that person somehow. Or are you expressing, I'm finding this really tricky, but I know God's got me. Third lesson, last one. Learn to put off grumbling by praising God instead. See, what's one of the cures to a grumbling heart? Well, when we're fighting sin, we put off the sin and we put on something in its place. If you're putting off grumbling, what do you put on in its place? Gratitude, praise. And this is what the Israelites actually got right at the start. When they're rescued out of the Red Sea, they, they stopped fearing the Egyptians and they praised God in song. Where they went wrong was that they stopped singing the song. I just can't help but wondering, what would have happened had they kept singing that song for the next three days, so that when they turn up at Mara and they don't have water, would they have remembered the Lord better? Sing together. And so, friends, if we're going to have joyful hearts, we need to remember our salvation, remember the great acts of kindness of God toward us, and know who God is because of that, and sing A key way to do this is by rehearsing our salvation in song week after week together. See, the singing that we do every week, it's not a, we don't just put it at the start in case you rock up to church late and so, you know, there's something that you can miss. No! We we sing at the start and the, the end because we want to lift our voices together and stir one another to see the reality of the glory of God towards us in the cross. And we want to lift it, we want to use our lips the right way, not grumbling, but praising God. Now, let me say something that sounds oxymoronic, I don't know if that's a word, but you know what I mean. Um, Learn the discipline of singing joyfully. Learn the discipline of singing joyfully. Sometimes you'll come to church and you you won't feel like singing. You won't feel like it. You'll be here and maybe you'll sing, but maybe you won't because you won't feel it. Well, let me tell you, The way to stir a joyful heart is not by withholding your praise. That's going to have the opposite effect. The way to stir your heart is by leaning in, rehearsing the kindness of God toward you. In the context of song where there is harmony and melody that that is emotive, God's given us this gift that touches our hearts, that stirs emotions in us for good. And so when when music and lyric go together, to teach us the goodness of God, that's a beautiful thing. Friend, what are your your words revealing about your heart? Are there things you need to repent of? Are there habits you need to change? Some of you may need to come to the Lord Jesus for the first time for forgiveness. But many of the rest of us just, um, we need to learn to put to death this habitual thing that's, that's normal in our culture, to whinge and complain, Not that we can't express hurt, we can, but do so with the heart that says, God, I know you and I know that you love me. Now, um, let me just tell you about my week briefly. Uh, This passage, the Spirit has ministered to me powerfully this week through this passage, because I tell you, I've had a hard week. Um, Some of you will have had a harder week, and that's okay, so um, hear that. But uh, four little kids, they've all been um, vomiting with the flu and, you know, so woken up every hour at night, so operating on very little sleep and the whole time what I've had in my head is, don't grumble, Dan, God loves you. Even in this circumstance where, you know, at 2am when it's the fourth time you've been woken up, I'm not grumbling right now, um, what, what, I, what I naturally go to do is, Ugh. but no, even in that circumstance, The Lord is teaching me His goodness and kindness to me. He's got me. He hasn't abandoned me. And so, friends, um, some of you will have have had harder weeks than me. But in all circumstances, the Lord works for the good of those who love Him. He's gracious and compassionate. Let's trust Him with our lives, hey? I'll pray. Father, we give You thanks that You know us and You love us, despite our, um, our weakness, despite our forgetfulness, and we, we see ourselves in the Israelites, and yet even despite all of our sin, You have been so gracious to us. Thank You for Your steadfast love. Please change our hearts in the moments where we're finding life tricky, especially, recall, recall these words to mind uh, for us, 
and help us to use our lips not to grumble at you, but to have um, gratitude in our hearts and to speak praise and to trust you in all things, we pray. Amen.